Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris sui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Deo, et pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et tenor mortis nostre, Amen. Nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Brethren in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus. In secula. This is Timothy Flanders with the meaning of Catholic. Welcome again to the Terror of Demons Morning Show with Kennedy Hall. How you doing, brother? Living the dream. How about you? Doing excellent. We're here on a Tuesday because Kennedy had to go uh, chop some wood and be a lumberjack with his family and go camping because that's what Canadians do. <laughs> so uh, welcome to the fourth sun, fourth week after Pentecost. We have a great feast this week, the, the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. Mm. Make sure that you make a big bonfire, as is the custom. Because our our uh, Saint John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. Because after this point, the light of the uh, of the daylight gets shorter and shorter and shorter until Christmas, which is the light of Christ, and then the daylight once again gets bigger from that point. So it's a great custom, and it's a great feast day for French Catholics of Canada. Uh, Jean Baptiste, and speaking of Canadians, once again, <laughs> this Canadian is launching the Kennedy profession. So we have a very important announcement that uh, we want everybody to sign up for the Crusade Channel. Let me get this pulled up. There is a new Crusade. Let's see, is that full screen? Let's make this thing. Okay, here we go. Is the audio playing? Oh, no. Okay. Well, technical difficulties there. I was told that there's no audio. Sorry about that. I tested this. And it didn't work still. Okay, anyways, you can't see this awesome video that is going to convince everybody to subscribe to this. That, that was that was an excellent, uh, excellent promotion. So the point is, channel, Crusade Channel is not censored. That's right. Because Mike Church has built some kind of infrastructure, and Kennedy knows more about this, but he's built some kind of infrastructure to allow it so that his servers are independent of everything else and he cannot get canceled, he can't get shut down. And the Kennedy profession is gonna be a daily show from Kennedy, and you can subscribe for $10 a month. Yep. So and, please sign up to help not Kennedy. Just, Go ahead. It's not just for my show, it's for the whole channel. So he's been doing morning radio for years, like 30 years or something, and um, eventually went in to do his own thing. Uh, in a more sort of uh, Catholic direction. It's not a, you know, technically speaking, a Catholic radio station. We're not uh, an apologetic station or something like that. But it's just, it, you know, it's conservative <clears throat> conservative talk radio, but everyone on there is going to give you a Catholic perspective. So there's actually other great shows on there as well. For example, they have a money show, you know, just talking about finances. 
and the host of that is just a faithful Catholic and it's great financial advice. Um, but you know, obviously with the sentiment of understanding, uh, how a Catholic should understand money, you know, avoiding usury if you can, and, um, you know, what kind of family life you should have and, and that sort of thing. So everything, it's just like everything you want out of good talk radio, but you, you can rest assured that it's going to be coming from a perspective where you're not going to hear any comments that are offside because this is some good radio hosts out there. I mean, Rush Limbaugh was great, for example. Um, let, let me just try this one more time. I think I know what happened here. Okay. Let me know. So viewers, let me know if this still does not have audio. Not really. Because being awake is the enemy of being woke. Here's what I want to know. Why is it this Emperor Fauciatine guy buried, not in jail, underneath the jail with his henchman, Stark Vader? Mm -hmm. For six long years, Mike Church and the Crusade Channel have waged daily mortal combat with the cult of death. But saving the world is a full-time gig. That's why we brought in Kennedy Hall. Mike Church and the Crusade Channel are doing their part. And I can do mine. I'm asking you to join me. Big tech and the elites don't like our message. And they'll do anything they can to censor us. So no one hears the truth. Have fun with that. But you can't censor the crusade. We need 500 new subscribers to make this happen. You can waste your money in a lot of places, but why not spend 10 bucks a month to join the Crusade channel and be part of something big? Do this now to guarantee my July 19th launch date. Listen to the Mike Church Show on Crusade channel for my guest appearances, regular guest hostings, and for announcements about the show. Oh, man, I think I left my pipe in the woods. The Crusade channel, the last live radio station standing. Click the link to subscribe. Use the code name, Kennedy. Okay, so apparently the audio was lower, but now you can hear it. So everybody turn up your turn up your video to watch the excellent ad that uh, it, this was on scene in Canada, right? Oh, yeah, we were actually in Niagara when we filmed that. So we were uh, the backdrop of freedom behind us. And uh, we stared totalitarianism down right in the face. <laughs> yeah. So the real question is, did you find your pipe? Because you can't really launch without your pipe, right? I have like seven or eight. So don't worry. I always oh, got good, good, good. Okay. So you, you left it as a relic to you uh, know, convert Canada. Yeah, sometimes, you know, Canadians, we just end up finding ourselves in the middle of the woods, surrounded by, <laughs> surrounded by beavers and things, and we just, <laughs> it just kind of happens. Okay, we saw so, a beaver so, on the weekend. So Kennedy needs uh, 500 subscribers yeah. to launch this show July 19. Yeah. So this is a great investment for Catholics. Like I said, you, it's great content from Kennedy, as you know, from this show every week, you've got more Kennedy out of this. <laughs> uh, you don't have me giving him all these counterpoints that I'm going to try to do today. But uh, so you can just get Kennedy 100 percent and uh, so many so much other other great content. Mike Church is excellent. What a great radio host. I know that um, uh, brother. Andre for, yes, he's for, he's on it as well. He has a great program and Rick Barrett. And so basically, you know, um, the goal of the crusade channel is really to, uh, take it, it's, it's an approach that saints like St. Maximilian Colby and, and others have taken where you just use the technologies and, um, uh, it's so again, um, you know, we need to know what's going on depending on our state in life, you know, you need to understand the culture because you live in it, you know, and that's, that's just the reality. I mean, you wish you sometimes you got to unplug in some ways and definitely that's important, but you've also got to work and live and raise your kids and understand elections and all this kind of stuff, because it's just, it's where you are. And, um, so, uh, you know, get out of the big, the big tech mainstream and do that, you know, Fox news. Okay. Is some of the stuff fine. Yeah. Some of it's fine. Uh, but some of it's just really lame and you want to get out of it. Or some of the opinions are, you know, basically just liberal, but they're have a veneer of conservatism. Um, some of the channels like daily wire and stuff, they can be okay. Um, 
but uh, again, it's it's not Catholic. So you listen to it and you go, that was great. And then and you hear a comment and it's like, oh, that was just really offside. And at least with this, you know, I mean, you can keep it on around your family because you know who it's coming from. Um, and it's true radio. That's uh, it's a type of radio is a different type of broadcasting. It's way different than podcasting. You know, it's much more animated sound effects, uh, longer monologues, guests calling in live things happening. Uh, and the nice thing is because it's internet radio. So it's it that uh, you, you, you download the app when you subscribe or use the website, use the browser. You can listen to it from anywhere and you can also listen to it later on. So, you know, if you if you subscribe, you can the, the shows are recorded and um so it's really great, and uh, I think it's going to be pretty big, and um, it's pretty fun because if you like to talk and talk and talk and talk for a living, it's a good job. So <laughs> it's good for me, and I'm very grateful to Mike Church for doing it because um, uh, it's going to be big. And and his show in the morning is, is is very specific. Like he's he's an encyclopedic mind about about American constitutional historical things. So he goes really into the nitty, nitty gritty of the legal stuff going on a lot of the time. But for me, it's going to take more of a uh, broad strokes cultural view. So, of course, I don't live in the United States, um, uh, but I see everything that's happening. And uh, I see how they're affecting us, both in Canada and the United States. So we're going to take more of a view of this event is happening, this person saying this, uh, this, is, this is how we have to understand it, and this is the proper way to approach it. So it'll be good. Yes, excellent. Uh, everyone, please subscribe. Ten dollars a month. That's not that much. You can afford it. And this yeah. is to this is not only investment in Kennedy. It's an investment in Catholic communications, yeah. which are totally independent because it really needs. And Remnant TV did this as well, that, which is good as well. Um, we just need to build independent infrastructures, independent yeah. to the tech giants, independent to the Marxists. It's very important because it's not going to, we're not going to, I mean, YouTube's going to cancel meaning of Catholic eventually. Probably. Yeah. I mean, what, what, yeah. it's just, it's, it's going to happen. So we need to have these second, we have the secondary infrastructures in place. So it's very important to, I encourage all viewers, please subscribe. The link is below $10 a month. This is an investment for all Catholics ultimately with this infrastructure. So without any further discussion we'll, we'll be continuing to promote this on Maine and if catholic over the next month so that we get all the subscribers we need by god's grace and remember to pray your novena to saint john the baptist and light a fire on thursday for saint john the baptist so today we have debate number two fatima today we so we've been discussing about fatima and we've been attempting to show a great deal of historical context but the other purpose of this is to build mental virtue because just like the Marxists, a lot of Catholics don't have mental virtue. What do I mean yeah. by that? Hmm. I mean the virtues that allow you to judge rightly, judge according to evidence, according to reason and logic. Many Catholics just know how to repeat a slogan. Yeah. They just know how to retweet sensational news. They don't know how to weigh the evidence. And they also don't know how to have a conversation among men where we can dispute and disagree and not sin against charity and endanger our, our own souls. And so the purpose of this is to attempt to create a conversation where we are delving deeper into evidence and presenting different viewpoints and that type of thing. So, and just for viewers, so the viewers understand myself, I do not have any strong opinions about Fatima because I have not studied it thoroughly. There's many different texts to read in three, four, five, six different languages, many yeah. different secondary sources. It's a big topic, and I do not have the research behind me to have any strong opinion. So everything I say from here on out in this debate may or may not be my personal opinion on the matter, but I'm going to attempt to provide a counterpoint to what Kennedy says. And what Kennedy says is, is more or less the viewpoint of the Fatima Center and Father Gruner's legacy. And so that's that's one perspective based on the evidence, looking at the evidence, coming to a conclusion about that. And then I'm going to try to look at the evidence in a different way and present other evidence. And the purpose of this, again, is so that we can build this mental virtue, which is seriously lacking, which is endangering souls because social media is evil. 
And it's carting off souls to hell because Catholics are addicted to the pleasures of likes and retweets and attention and all this. They don't want the truth. They don't want to delve into the truth and debate things. And that's what we're trying to do on Meaning of Catholic. So, and it's a very important part about Catholic masculinity. So, <laughs> Kennedy, any you, any thoughts on this before we get into the topic? Yes. With Fatima, people need to be careful not to get into the, uh, well, spinning themselves into a web where their entire faith is based around uh, factoids or something. Um, it's good to have your faith rooted in a devotion in a sense. I mean, like I'm a, before I discovered Fatima a few years ago, I was a Guadalupano, you know, I would, Our Lady of Guadalupe is massive for my life and, you know, her images are in my house and I constantly think about it and it really means a lot to me and it's kind of in a, in a good way, kind of all consuming of my Marian devotion. That's good because it's, it's edifying, but <clears throat> There is a there is a conspiratorial aspect to Fatima, for good reason. I mean, I, you know, obviously people know where I stand on it. Um, but you know, if if it becomes all consuming, where you know, it becomes almost like a. Uh, if, if anyone ever saw that movie, The Zodiac Killer, or something like that, there was a the guy wanted to discover the the mystery or the uh, he wanted to figure out the the uh, conspiracy so bad that his wife ended up leaving him. You know because. It just he was obsessed and it made you know people can do that sort of thing with Fatima and that's not good um, because that would take away from actually getting to heaven because you wouldn't be praying you wouldn't be um, doing the actual fullness of the message with which includes not only the third secret not only the consecration of Russia but also the first Saturdays and reparation for sins against the Immaculate Heart and so on and so forth. You're right, right. I think that's. That's an excellent, I mean, God will not judge us about whether or not we get a historical assertion. This is a historical assertion, ultimately, in terms of whether the third secret was this or that or this particular point, which we're going to debate. We're going to debate those historical assertions. That's good. That's fine. They're important. But what's more important <coughs> is your penance. So God will not send you to hell because you got an, a historical assertion wrong based on a lot of conflicting evidence. God's not going to send you to hell for that, but he will send you to hell if you don't repent. So if you're mm. obsessed about all these different conspiracies and everything and conspiracies are happening, we're not denying that they're happening, they but happen. if you get so obsessed about it that you're not, you're not uh, repenting and overcoming sin, you're going to go to hell. One of the things you realize, <clears throat> uh, Jesus showed us with one of the first bishops that there can be conspiracies within the church against the church. And his name was Judas. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that tends, and that happens. So it's a reality, but, it is uh, not the only thing, and so you have to test them. You know, I think this is a little t side note, but one of the great sadnesses of the Jesuit order falling from grace is that um, the eminently useful and practical Jesuitical spirituality of testing the spirits, discerning the spirits, um, has been lost. And I think it's hugely important. It's been very important in my spiritual life, and. Um, uh, if something is 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 causing you to uh, become overly cantankerous and negative, um, listen. Truth can be negative. It's not positive. It's 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 hard to swallow. But ultimately, um, if God's allowing it, um, then in some way it's for the greater good and it's for His plan. So um, there are injustices with Fatima and, and and things like that. But you can't allow it to turn you into somebody who. Um, grows resentful of, of a large group of Catholics and so forth, because again, the position can be correct, but if it's, if it's, um, you know, Father Ripperger has a great conference on the negative effects of, you know, the spiritual effects of negative thinking or something like that. And it's true, you know, um, so we have to avoid that. And, and that can be a pitfall for, for Fatima. Yeah. The humility means conformity with the truth. So sure. if, if you have the truth of Fatima, but you don't conform yourself to it, i.e. Yeah. through penance, you'll go to hell. So very important point. You could just turn off this whole show. Everything else is not as important of what, as what we just said. So just trying to emphasize that. So without further ado, let's get into the controversies. So this, this really begins, this period begins 1944 mm -hmm. with the apparition of Our Lady to Sister Lucia, which mm -hmm. happens, which is reported in the, mo the newest source, 
for information, 2013 is the biography of Sister Lucia from the the sisters of Coimbra, her her uh, her Carmel, her, her convent, which indicate that Our Lady came to her in 1944, and she said to her, because she had been commanded by her bishop to write down the third secret, but she was also commanded by Our Lady to not reveal it to anyone. So that was how it stood. So she was conflicted. But then Our Lady appeared to her and said, write down what has what you have been told of the vision, but not which was given to you to understand. So this is the beginning of the, of the third secret controversy, which we'll get into another time. I'm going I'm to pass over that, uh, the 2000 reveal, because that, that's going to be another debate in the future. But the key point here is that I don't find any source, Kennedy. Here's my first point, is that I don't find any source which actually says that so the what was written on the envelope, as we know, we know from TV evidence, Bertone later, is that the envelope said, by express order of Our Lady not to be opened before 1960. She does not say to be published to the world. So my first point is, there's no statement where Our Lady <laughs> stipulated that it needed to be released to the whole world, but rather just opened. And in fact, it was actually not even stipulated for the Pope. It was for these other bishops in Portugal to be opened in 1960. And as we know from a letter to Pius XII, Sister Lucia intended 1960 because she believed communism would be at the climax. Uh, but it was commanded by Our Lady to be open in 1960, but not to be published by the world. Kennedy, you have any thoughts so far? Uh, well, I mean, that could be true. Um, but, well, if the message concerns the world, if it concerns the state of the world, if it's advantageous for Catholics to hear the truth in order to do penance and to uh, live out the message fully, then I guess it's under the discretion of the Pope to make that decision. Um, and in the same way, it's not said that it shouldn't be released to the world, right? So, um, uh, you know, if, if, if heaven gave a nun or a bishop a message saying all you know catholics should know x y and z in order to save their souls then it would be it would behoove the pope to tell us that um so i guess yeah it doesn't say it must be released to the world but it doesn't say that it shouldn't be released to the world um so that's up to the pope to make that decision and it seems that the fatima message is a universal message um especially with the idea of whole nations being annihilated and all that sort of stuff um and also it would follow in the characteristics of fatima since our lady did release or did reveal all these secrets to the fatima children and in front of thousands eventually with the miracles and so on and especially miracle of the sun um, and there was never any issue with with those things um with being released to everybody and of course um <clears throat> Sister Lucy was was um, told about the first Saturday devotions very specifically. Well, clearly that was told to the rest of the world. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, again, was there an express command from, from heaven saying, make sure you go tell this to the whole world, or was it just Catholics ought to do X, Y, and Z? Well, then you infer from that, okay, well, I should probably tell everybody. Um, so sure, there's no express thing saying it must be released, but there's no thing, nothing saying that it shouldn't released and that would be a matter of prudence um on behalf of the bishops and the pope in charge yeah so what we want to distinguish here is between a, a real cover-up on the one hand which is a, a nefarious cover-up where wicked bishops cover something up which should should be revealed and on the other hand there is actually a prudent secret being kept there's a papal secret it's been in place for how, how long uh there is a sense when the clergy do need to hide things from the laity because if they just publish thing abroad, it's just going to cause a scandal. It's just going to yeah. take it's our fathers as fathers. You and I are fathers. Sometimes we don't tell our children the whole truth because they just can't no. take it right now or it's just no. going to cause problems or whatever. And that that is their purview. So it's it's it is not a problem. What we need to know is why did they cover up or why did they not release it? Because the Vatican has been, as we've discussed in this in the show before under Pius XI, at least, there were various evil evil men in the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And it's been this way for centuries. I mean, let's just realize it this. It but it's always going to be a, a mixture of good and bad men. It's a huge mixture of good and bad men, and we would need a full inquisition to be able to determine who is who. Not what only else? that, but individuals, even individual men, can be good and bad too. Some can make good decisions here or bad yeah. decisions there. Yeah. So th this is the reality people people just want to make one person all bad and i'll discuss this in a minute about john the 23rd 
But first, we got to mention the the fake sister Lucia theory. But I will just add quickly. Oh, go ahead. Though, um, the church never acted as if that. Well, sorry, I should say it. It, it doesn't seem as if if any hierarch in the church acted as if there was a private re reality to the Fatima message and revelations until we get to the third secret controversy. So um, no problem telling everyone about the first part, first secret, no pro problem telling about the second, no problem telling everybody the apparitions, no problems uh, revealing information, things from Sister Lucy. All of a sudden, when we get to the third secret, well, you know, we didn't, we weren't technically told that we had to tell everybody what was in this. It doesn't seem in in uh, continuity with the entire uh, series of apparitions, which were all public for everybody to see. It doesn't seem it's in continuity with everything else that was released. And then the Vatican acted as if it would was there under their discretion um, to release the third secret in some fashion in, in the year two thousand. Um, so uh, again, that's proof that it's not uh, it's not the case that we ought not to know what's in it. What really it comes down to is what is the true information. And if there is falsity, that's a big problem. But I don't think there's an issue saying that it has to be released or not. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I, I certainly concede uh, your your logical critique, uh, which you're saying that it just makes sense that it would make sense with Fatima for this Everything to be released else. as it was. Yeah. That, that's, that's a reasonable point. But as you are also conceding, we, we do need the express order of Our Lady in particular situations because it may be makes sense, but Our Lady may not wish it that way. And so we also and we also yeah. don't have anything saying don't release it. You know, that's so, true. Yeah, so. I, I mean, to my knowledge, I, I, I can see that as well. Um, but we want to touch on the fake Sister Lucius theory because yeah. <laughs> this is something that's been going around the Internet. Basically, uh, a man has funded an effort to investigate whether there was a fake Sister Lucia around this time, 1957, 1960 or so, whether or not the real Sister Lucia was, God forbid, murdered or something, and then they, they put an imposter in her place, something like that. Because the real yeah. problem, which is the big problem for Kennedy's position that I'm going to try to emphasize here, is that Sister Lucia did not run off from the convent and join the traditionalist movement. And so if, if you want to use Sister Lucia to support all sorts of different traditionalist viewpoints, yeah, you need to somehow get a get away around the fact that she supported John Paul II. She supported all the so-called Vatican II church. Mm -hmm. So you need to somehow get around that. So the fake Sister Lucia's theory works with that. Now, Kennedy and I, however, are, are rather in agreement on on being skeptical about this theory. And the reason for me being skeptical is basically the, the evidence as I, as I understand it for the, for this theory is that this man paid a number of different scientific experts, uh, plastic surgeons, dental experts at whatnot. And they analyzed the sister Lucia from the thirties, forties, and fifties. And then the sister Lucia from the sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, two thousands. And they found that there was a lot of discrepancies in her facial structure and her handwriting and whatnot and sort of things like that. And they had cropped a few photographs, apparently. So, you know, that's suspicious. Yeah. So, but the problem is that, one, we know that Sister Lucia's uh, teeth were rotting and she had dental surgery. She wore dentures, which ha which has some that does something to your facial structure that has a, a massive effect on the way your whole face looks. So it makes sense that her face would look different. That's yeah. that's totally plausible. But even further, it's very easy to prove this. Very, very easy to prove this because Sister Lucia was not in a forest for her whole life and nobody knew her. She had friends and relatives. Yeah. All you have to do is get counts. friends and relatives yeah. to say, hey, wait a second. This is not the same person. And they would know because they know the sound of her voice. They know what she looks like. They know her mannerisms. So all you need to do is just find one person who's been claiming since 1960 that this person is a different person. That's a pretty easy thing to find in all the historical records, all the people who talked about her, everybody who met her. How easy is that to find? But to my knowledge, they haven't br brought, found anybody who claims that until now. Now this theory arises. So I find it very questionable, this, this theory. Kennedy, what are your thoughts? It's quite questionable. And it's very, uh, what's the word? It's it's risky business trying to use photographs. Um, 
of like there's only there's not that many photographs of Sister Lucy uh, because she was a cloistered nun. I mean, if you've ever been around cloistered nuns, well, you haven't been around cloistered nuns that much because you don't get to go around cloistered nuns that much. So there's a lot of there's an absence of of evidence in my opinion. Um, also. Uh, I sent you that timeline, for example, third secret timeline. There are numerous occasions where um, priests and people of all stripes are, I had an interview with Sister Lucy. I talked to Sister Lucy, 1940s, 1950s, 1980s, you know. Um, and um, so I just don't think it works. Uh, I think it's kind of grasping its thrust. I understand why they do this. The, one of the reasons why they do the third sister or the <coughs> fake Sister Lucy thing is to sort of it almost plays more into the state of Acantus position where the 1950s um, consecration actually did happen because if Sister Lucy had died in the, I don't know, 50s and 60s, as they'd say, whatever it is, then all of her comments that come out in the 1980s saying, well, the consecration in 1982 didn't suffice because of reasons X, Y, and Z, those are out the window. I think it's kind of, uh, I don't know, it's an easy out saying um, all we have is what she said. In the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, everything else after that is fake. Um, so that's the only, it, it sort of gets rid of things you have to wrestle with. And um, the most in depth study of all things Fatima was done, you know, by Father Grinner and underneath his watch. And uh, there are numerous accounts of people who are speaking with Sister Lucy. Um, sure, she was silenced, and that happens. That happened to Padre Pio. You know, they go back to your convent and don't really say anything. That sort of thing happens, but that doesn't mean that someone goes out of existence. Um, and I will say one thing as well, too, when you said um, sort of the traditionalist position regarding Fatima. One of the things that's really nice, edifying about Fatima, in my opinion, um, is it's sure it's definitely a traditionalist thing insofar as uh, generally speaking, traditional Catholics try, well, they're more open to conspiracy because that's kind of part of being a traditional Catholic is where the mass go, this is why, and Bunini, and you just you get, kind of get into that milieu because it's just something you sort of have to deal with. Um, you also start seeing a lot of, uh, let's say, actions that are not of goodwill often when you're trying to find somewhere to go to Latin mass or dealing with chancery offices and things. That's just something we deal with. So that's, I understand why traditionalists get attracted to that so easily. Um, but the Fatima uh, legacy, the, one of the reasons why I think it's such a powerful devotion and uh, reality is that it really is uh, cross ritual or it's cross, uh, like it, Nova Sordo and traditionalists alike have been devoted to the Fatima, seeking of the Fatima truth for a long time, because um, ultimately, whether you have access to a Latin mass or not, um, you can do the same thing regarding the Fatima devotion. For example, with the first Saturdays, it's, yes, it'd be nice if you go to a traditional mass where the priests are trying to give you first Saturday devotions, and they're doing things like giving you a holy hour, preaching about the, the message, providing the literature, and that happens at traditional chapels, and that's an amazing thing. But I know people who did the first Saturday devotion um, couldn't access traditional mass, and they, I think they went to a Polish daily mass for like uh, the, the, the amount of Saturdays in a row because it was the only one in the city. But the point is they were able to complete the devotion, and um, the Fatima thing brings a lot of people together. So is it a traditionalist thing? Sort of. I think it's just... Uh, uh, it's just, it's something that unifies. Also, um, one of the reasons why, uh, what's so strange about the different popes like Ratzinger and, and, and Pope John Paul II, um, with regards to, okay, they're not, people don't see them as traditionalists, but Sister Lucy's talking about them and, and all that sort of thing. You'll find some amazing quotes, which we go over maybe a little bit later, by uh, the various popes, where they seem almost out of character. It's like, that sounds like something you'd hear on the Tiller Marshall show, not something that we hear from Theology of the Body or something like that. And um, that's kind of one of the astonishing things, too, is when Fatima really gets brought up and the popes are really pressed, the answers get real uh, traditional sounding, if that makes sense, which I think is interesting. Okay, okay. So basically the, um, the sort of trad narrative mm -hmm. that I, I am going to critique here is essentially that Fatima had a message of penance, and but John the Twenty Third wanted to go into this Tillhardian optimism and, and make Vatican II and, and betray the whole church, and so Vatican came in and silenced Sister Lucia. They threw away in a convent, said you're not allowed to speak. Um, 
and they wouldn't release the third secret because the third secret was again their whole plan of betraying the faith and the pope betrayed fatima paul the sixth betrayed fatima and fatima is the answer now i submit that that is too oversimplified i would concede part of that but i think it's too oversimplified for some of the reasons that i will discuss here um but part of that is the father fuentes interview um some of the things that sister lucia says in that interview so just for viewers father fuentes was a postulator for the cause of saints jacinta and marta and he talked to sister lucia in 1957 yeah. He published a conference that was the original language was in Spanish. And then there was a translation done in English, which he certified. Yep. And then there was a translation of the English back into Portuguese, which yep. then came to Sister Lucia. Now, Kennedy, what what are some of the things that he says in Fu, in the Fuentes uh, interview that's that's of note for this whole story? Um doesn't she say that there's an impending chastisement? Yes, and the and the concepts of of, of major calamities uh, affecting the earth is a big deal. Um, basically, God's about to punish the world. <laughs> um, so the Fuentes thing is is one of the bigger controversies because essentially uh, it kind of was released without any. Well, it wasn't a big deal when it sort of first happened in the 1950s, and then after that, an anonymous. An anonymous communication from the Chancery Office of the of the diocese in Portugal came out and basically said, "This is not to be trusted. This is bad." So, for about 10, 15 years, the Father Fuentes thing, and I believe he was taken off of the causes at that point. I think he was sort of, a, 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 let's say, um, cast aside. Um, but then what happened was, so anyway, that sort of you can't trust this. This is wrong. So on and so forth. But then, um, on, uh, in comes Father. Alonzo, and he was commissioned, if I'm not mistaken, to be the official Fatima archivist for the Vatican. So, the interesting thing again about the Fatima, about the Fatima um, apparitions and sort of, or the, the the Fatima conspiracy, let's call it that, you end up finding these priests who are not, uh, like they're not so-called traditionalists. I don't, I'm not saying they weren't traditional in their piety. I just mean they're 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 they're, they're evidence that the sort of message is being tested. You know, Father Alonzo was coming in sort of saying, hey, uh, this is the church's position. We can't have any of this crazy conspiracy stuff. What actually happened? So for a while, Father Alonzo had a, had basically, uh, let's say, gone along with this narrative that, yeah, Father Fuentes was out of step. That sort of was sensationalism. It didn't really happen. But then eventually, and there's this book here that I have uh, called the Secret of Fatima, Fact and Legend. This is what it looks like. It's. I think you can still find it on. Where is it? Can you see it very well? There you go. I think you can still find it on um, Amazon, but I have an old copy. And um, he actually says in it, he says, the genuine text, and he's referring to the, the um, conversation between Sister Lucy and Father Fuentes. Um, the genuine text, the only one that can be justly attributed to Father Fuentes. And he says that because there were fake ones that came out, like almost like fan fiction. So, but the, the original one is accessible. It says, does not, does not, in my opinion, contain anything that could give rise to the condemnatory notice from Coimbra. So basically he's saying there's no reason why that letter should have been put out the bishop's office because it doesn't contain anything that should be condemned. On the contrary, it contains a teaching most suited to edify the piety of Christians. Um, so Father Alonso himself ends up coming around the 1970s to, yeah, Father Fuente seems like he was telling the truth. There's nothing wrong with this. I don't know why this was condemned. But by that time, it's almost 20 years later, and basically the uh, narrative that this is another fat of a conspiracy, conspiracist, con, uh, conspiracist, what's the word I'm looking for? Conspiracy theorist, whatever, um, had been already disseminated. And once it's out of the bottle, it's hard to put back in. So... Father Fuentes, uh, some people do critique. They say maybe his report, he put his own opinions in like what it meant. That's fine. But as far as the actual text between him and Sister Lucy, they said there's no reason to disbelieve that. And that's that's the position of Father Alonso, who was the official Vatican archivist and did the proper research. So again, not coming from some traditionalist blog or something, but an actual man sent from Rome to do a job. Yes, I, I, I can't answer this particular assertion of yours because I haven't... Uh get gotten further into Lonzo. Um, but th this is the text that everyone needs to read to find the counterpoint here, which is Kevin Simmons. Uh, his chapter five goes into detail about this. And Simmons is not, 
he's not pushing a narrative. He basically has a lot of, uh, he says it's, it's kind of both and it's like, it's some of that. Yes. Some of this is true. Some of it's not true. Different aspects of it are true. According to the evidence, some of, some of it are not, but the Fuentes article or the Fuentes interview is important because the trad narrative is, well, this whole chastisement was about to happen. This is all penance, penance, penance is all going to be destroyed and Vatican II betrays everything. Now, but I will, what I will say about it is that this is the first instance of the this this wrong narrative about Fatima disregarding the words of Sister Lucia herself. And I, my my constant assertion during all our debates, Kennedy, is going to be that we need to keep Sister Lucia as the most important source for yeah. interpreting all of these things both the consecration, the third secret and everything, Sister Lucia's words herself are the most important. Well, what are Sister Lucia's words about Father Fuentes? She says this in the statement from the diocese. Now you say it's an anonymous. Well, that's, that doesn't matter. The, the bishop or the dicasteries, there are, there are anonymous letters that are published all the time, which are just put, the bishop puts a seal, whatever. It, anonymous does not necessarily mean it's suspicious. It could, or it could not. Yeah. But what does the evidence say? The evidence quote, Sister Lucia, and she says this, quote, Father Fuente spoke with me in his capacity as postulator, da, 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 da. We spoke only of things related to the subject. Therefore, whatever else he refers to, so she's saying, yes, we talked about Jacinta and Marta, but whatever else besides that he refers to is neither exact nor true. I am sorry about it, for I do not understand what good can be done for souls when it is not based on God. Who is the truth? I know nothing and could therefore say nothing about such punishments, which are falsely attributed to me. So there we have it. Lucia herself condemns Fuentes. And Alonzo may say, come back and say, well, there's nothing particularly about against the faith or against Fatima here. But what we have is a problem of veracity, problem of was did she actually say this or not? And Lucia well, said she didn't. Well, the report says Lucia, Lucy, Lucy said that. Because again, when we're talking about things said by Sister Lucy, all of it is relayed secondhand, uh, except for the odd letter. So the vast this is the thing that I think can be disingenuous on the other side, let's say the non-traditionalist side, if you want to call it that, is they'll say, well, uh, you know, we don't have any specific evidence Sister Lucy actually said that, but then they have no problem going to an anonymous which anon an 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 anonymity doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but it is out of step that there would be anonymity with regards to Sister Lucy because Sister Lucy didn't do anything anonymously. There was always very open about why she you know, she was. It was always very clear that Bishop so and so told Sister Lucy to say X, Y, and Z, or or to to release the information that she knew out of obedience or something. Or our Lord showed up to Sister Lucy and said, "Tell people this." You know, there was never any. Uh, when if you look at the whole corpus of things attributed to Sister Lucy, it's either directly from her in letter format under obedience, or from Our Lord or Our Lady telling her to do something, um, or it's interview format. Um, so it is sort of an anomaly that there would be this anonymous thing that would come out because it doesn't seem in con in continuity with everything else that had happened. So all I'm saying is, um, Sister Lu Sister Lucy has a massive corpus that there really is, and this this will come into in, into uh, discussion as well with the 1984 attempted consecration because basically what happens is, is you have sister Lucy in 1982 saying, no, the consecration was not done the way that it was specified. And then in 1984, they do the consecration in the exact same manner. And then all of a sudden they say, well, sister Lucy said this wasn't that bad this time. Um, so maybe she did. It could be, we find this with, um, we find this with great saints all the time where, um, uh, they themselves don't necessarily say everything in step with everything they've ever said because they're a human being and that's it's private revelation it's private discourse it's not necessarily the bible okay so there can be uh things that are out of step because people make uh, mistakes i'm not saying sister lucy made a mistake all i'm saying is um uh father alonzo was in charge of doing an investigation into the fatima archives and making distinctions about what's true and what's not true um, there's a letter that comes out from the Chancery Office. Sister Lucy says what she says. Now, when she says, um, I'll paraphrase what you said, but basically uh, we talked to uh, anything else that Father Alonzo basically added. That could also refer to his own comments because Father Father Alonzo says in here, um, uh, basically says uh, his report 
could uh, is mingled with the preacher's own oratorical embellishments. That's true. I mean, Father Alonzo, it's like, you know, if I give you uh, a passage from the Bible or from a saint and then I add all my commentary, my commentary could be completely off. But whatever I'm telling you, whatever I'm giving you that was said by the person, it really just matters if that's true or not. And then Father Alonzo goes on to say, um, the genuine text does not, in my opinion, contain anything that could not that could give rise to the condemnatory notice from Quembra. So you can take Sister Lucy's words from this anonymous report one way or the other because um, she's saying anything Father Alonzo added that wasn't about the specifics, I can't account for that. But she didn't say what or was not actually what she said in it. There's a little bit of vagueness, if you want to call it there. So sure, um, but uh, I don't think that this that discredits what Father Alonzo put down. Okay, um, and we got to move on here. But sure. basically, and this is going to come up again and again, uh, with a lot of this stuff is that I'm going to say, well, Sister Lucia said this, and then Kennedy, you just brought up, well, we're not sure if she said that or not because it's reported second hand. Well, okay, that's true. I concede that, but you have to give evidence if you're going to actually assert something otherwise. If you're going to assert that Sister Lucia actually didn't say that, well, then what's the evidence of that? All, all we have is, as far as we know, diocese said this, diocese reported this. We're going to have, later on, we're going to have published uh, met the memoirs of Sister Lucia. We're going to have letters of Sister Lucia. We're going to have books of Sister Lucia with say X, Y, Z. I'm not saying she didn't and, say it. I'm just saying. Right. Okay. Okay. But th this is a general issue that is going to come up. I see people in the chat saying, well, the Vatican hides X, Y, Z. Well, yes, they do hide X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. Vatican is corrupt in a lot of a lot of things, but that doesn't mean every man, woman, uh, man, woman, and child involved in anything is completely corrupt and always hiding every single no, thing. 100%. It, it, it doesn't, which is why, right. again, I think we look at the whole corpus and this is what father Alonso himself did in 1957 is the father Fuentes interview. Father Alonso is writing this first, this book, the uh, Fatima fact and legend. Um, I believe it came out in 1982 or the second printing. The first printing was 1979. He's looking at everything and then because he realizes there are issues. So he's critiquing Father Fuentes where it's good to critique him, but then saying, but you know what? After all said and done, this seems in step with everything Sister Lucy has said before. Um, so I just yeah. think the overall... I mean, that's rational. Pardon? I, I mean, I concede it's a rational conclusion of Lanza. I just think... And, and again, yeah. he's, not an, he's not an ally of the so-called Fatima conspiracy. He's just a man with a job from Rome trying to make the best decision. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we got to move on to 1960 and the opening of the third secret. And here's my sure. assertion. I'll just say what, what I'm going to assert. And then Kennedy, you can respond to this. Basically, lamentably, there's been a false narrative of John the 23rd, St. Yeah. John the 23rd, the Pope, that has been invented by liberal heretics that trads, unfortunately, have also parroted. And that narrative is John the 23rd was this crazy flamboyant liberal who just wanted to open up the doors and all this nonsense. That's not the man he was. And I, I, my two witnesses are traditional authors, Amerio Romano, one of the best texts about the post conciliar era, Yota Unum. Yota Unum. Yeah. Also Henry Sear, Phoenix mm -hmm. from the ashes. They both de debunk the myth that John the 23rd was some kind of liberal. In fact, he was incredibly traditional. Yeah. In 1960, he had the Roman Synod. The Roman Synod of 1960 was supposed to be a forerunner about what Vatican II was supposed to be. And what was that the Roman Synod about? It was about republishing the Council of Trent. Mm -hmm. It was about confirming Latin. It was about traditional ascetical priestly life. Mm -hmm. That was separate from profane things. It was very, very traditional. And if you look at the original schema of Vatican II, you see that John the 23rd was attempting to truly promote very, very traditional Orthodox Catholicism. That's what actually was happening. And so this false narrative, we just need to dismiss this. And it's unfortunate that trads have actually picked up on this because it actually was invented by the heretics. Don't well, parrot what the heretics say. So yeah. Uh, so, but this is the whole narrative is that, well, John the 23rd was, was just bursting with Teilhardian flamboyancy. And so he was just going on about Vatican II. That's not the reality because that, that goes into our, our Fatima controversy because he does open the third secret. Now it's reported by Alonso in one of his French editions that he said, it's not for my pontificate. 
but this is not actually sourced. I can't find any source would actually traces this back to him. So I, I, I doubt the veracity of that statement. I think that's a rumor. <laughs> um, what we know is that he opened it in 59 and it was read and he chose not to publish it. Now, there are reasons why you don't publish that third secret at a time when communism is at its height because it yeah. describes the assassination of the Pope. So if you want to publish a public, like, hey, let's tell the communists, hey, here's a public plan for you to assassinate the Holy Father. Check it out. Isn't that going to be great to help the communists, to help defeat the communists? Well, that's uh, that's kind of ridiculous to just say he has to absolutely release it, as we said before, and you conceded that the fact that Our Lady did not expressly state he had to publish it. But the other the other aspect of this is, there is a, the narrative is that the Vatican came and silenced her. But in reality, if you look at the the Car Carmelites of Coimbra, their biography, they describe, and I don't have time to quote this all because we don't have time for this, but they describe the fact that Sister Lucia wanted to be a secluded nun. That was part of her interior life was to be able to have a regulation of visitors. Now, she was not silenced. She could still talk. She still published books. She still had memoirs. She still had interviews. Her visits were merely regulated by the bishop for the sake of her interior life, which mm -hmm. it makes completely sense. I, she's a seer of Fatima. The whole world is flocking after her. She mm -hmm. can't even pray for five seconds without a new visitor. How is she supposed to save her soul? So it makes perfect sense that the Vatican or the bishops would try to regulate visitors. And so that that's the a other aspect of this. She was not silenced. She was allowed to speak. People could go and visit her, but it was just highly regulated so that she could have an interior life, as is her right to save her own soul. Mm -hmm. um, but the so the opening of the third secret, when when John the 23rd says his opening speech at Vatican II, which is that uh, we have these prophets of doom, we disagree with them, we're going into a new era. That does not necessarily need to be interpreted. Because it's it's only by implication that that gets attributed to a rejection of Fatima. It's by implication. He doesn't actually yeah. say who it was. Mm -hmm. He's referring to unnamed prophets of doom. Now, it could simply be the Vatican officials who opposed his council. And as I said, mm -hmm. the council, in fact, was very traditional in its planning and in his very intention of it. And so John the 23rd could simply be saying, hey, you are you're you are being skeptical about my council, which is going to be restoring the council of Trent and restoring this rigor to the priestly life and ascetic life and all this traditional stuff. You're skeptical about it, but I think it's going to bring a new era of piety. And I think we can, maybe you'd admit Kennedy, if that type of a council would have happened, maybe there would have actually been a great deal of piety. So there's yeah. my point, which, which uh, Kennedy, go ahead. Well, as regarding the whole narrative about Pope John the 23rd, um, fellow traditionalists, uh, one of the one of the uh, it was the term peritus peritus or whatever one of the fathers who was in charge of getting documents and things ready for the Second Vatican Council was Marcel Lefebvre, um, who was obviously the furthest thing from liberal, um, and they were all shocked at what happened when the council officially opened and they basically tore up the documents, um, basically tore them up in front of them and just started writing new working documents. So clearly the intention of the council included the expertise of men like uh, Cardinal Ottaviani, who again is the furthest thing from a liberal, uh, Marcel Lefebvre, and others who ended up fighting like crazy during the council to try and keep the original intention of, of what the direction was supposed to be. And also the Second Vatican Council in many ways was a continuation of the First Vatican Council, which was basically stopped because of war in Italy. Um, uh, so I wouldn't. I don't think anyone would say that the First Vatican Council was some sort of liberal plot. Um, although there's probably someone who would say that actually. But <laughs> um, but my point is is uh, and John Twenty Third died right at the beginning, and then it sort of it was a very. I mean, it was very. Tra John Twenty Third is kind of a tragic figure. I mean, most popes in some ways kind of are tragic figures that that seem to be part of the office. Um, but he, he died, and and um, there were people who advised. A, Pius XII against doing a Second Vatican Council because they thought the um, milieu, the atmosphere was ripe for um, corruption. They thought it was uh, it was a fertile ground for what did end up happening. So if anything, we can say it was prudentially not a good decision to go forth with the council in that atmosphere. That can be true. Um, and I will say too, though, um, John the 23rd 
I'm not going to remember exactly what the remark is, but he does allude to it not being something that was an infallible per se overall, um, you know, uh, council that was to define dogmas and things like that, which again can be from a place of goodwill, but it was definitely hijacked by the liberals. So John the 23rd, I have no major issue with John the 23rd. I've read some of his stuff. It's very, he was a very nice writer actually. He was very, uh, he seemed like he was a very pious and spiritual. They call him good Pope John, you know, and, um, but definitely things were hijacked. So, but he died. He died, and again, had men like Marcel Lefebvre and Nataviani writing the, the the documents for it. So how how liberal can you be if you have men like that uh, trying to put forth your vision? So fair enough with that. Um, as, and I'll say something about um, the Prophets of Doom thing. Um, this is from uh, October 1981, and this was actually published in the German magazine called Steam de Glauben. There you go. There's my German pronunciation. And this was actually a discussion with Pope John Paul II um, in November of 1980. Okay. Um, so regarding 1960 and so forth, the Holy Father was asked, what about the third secret of Fatima? Should it not have been published by 1960? And here speaks to the prudence you were talking about. Pope John Paul II replied, given the seriousness of the contents, so that, number one, oh, given the seriousness of content, well, we obviously know it's not just some some Hallmark card. Um, my predecessors in the Petrine office um, diplomatically preferred to postpone publication so as not to encourage the world power of communism to make certain moves. Fair enough. Um, on the other hand, it should be sufficient for all Christians to know this. If there is a message in which it is written that the oceans will flood whole areas of the earth and that from one moment to the next, millions of people will perish, Truly, the publication of such a message is no longer something to be so much desired. And if I may, this is classic John Paul II, where you're going, oh my, what are you saying here? Are you saying this is exactly what it contains? Or are you saying, if is this completely hypothetical? Because you can take it in both directions, and that unfortunately leads to disagreement. But he continues, the Pope continued, many wish to know simply from curiosity and a taste for the sensational which we both agree is, is a problem. Um, but they forget that knowledge also implies responsibility. They only seek the, the satisfaction of their curiosity, and that is dangerous if, at the same time, they are not disposed to do something, and if they are convinced that it is impossible to do anything against evil. At this point, the Pope grasped the rosary and said, here is the remedy against this evil. Pray, pray, and ask for nothing more. Leave everything else to the Mother of God. The Holy Father was then asked, what is going to happen to the church? And this is what he said. This is before the assassination attempt took place, by the way. Um, and John Paul II, saying that he knows, well, alluding that he knows what's in the third secret, mentions nothing about himself being assassinated, which he could have just left out, because why would you tell anybody that? Who knows? Um, but it's not, a, it, it, yeah, that's not a given. And he answered, we must prepare ourselves to suffer great trials before long such as will demand of us a disposition to give up even life and a total dedication to Christ and for Christ. With your prayer and my prayer, it is possible to mitigate this tribulation. I'm going to pause there for a second. He uses the word tribulation. Um, there definitely is a mention of tribulation, in a sense, in the revealed part of the third secret, but it seems to apply basically only to Rome. Uh, whereas if we're, uh, because that's pretty much what we see, but if we're talking about tribulation, meaning things that affect the world, that seems to be in lockstep with things like what Father Fuentes reported, the Sister Lucy said, as far as God is about to punish the world, because that would entail, what that would, that would um, include what's in a tribulation. Um, uh, but it is no longer possible to avert it. So John Paul II says it's coming, no matter what. Uh, because only thus can the church be effectively renewed. How many times has a renewal of the church sprung from blood? This time too, it will not be otherwise. So that's actually interesting as well. He says it will be from blood. Um, which is actually quite alarming. and It's not something I want to hear. <laughs> um, so definitely there is a way to interpret the messages of the third secret, for example as being spiritual, but John Paul II is saying it will spring forth from blood. So that's another thing when we start talking about the third secret, people will say, well, isn't this destruction of Rome theoretical? Isn't this the arrows being fired at the, you know, and he's, he's talking about it as if it is something that will come forth from blood being poured out by martyrs, essentially. Um, I guess someone might interpret that and say, well, that's John Paul, the assassination attempt. Okay. 
that doesn't really seem like a tribulation necessarily, and it doesn't necessarily doesn't doesn't sound like what he's saying here all the way through. He says, this time too, it will not be otherwise. We must be strong and prepared and then trust in Christ and his mother and be very, very assiduous in praying the rosary. So what does this mean? Well, when Pope John Paul II spoke at Fulda, he had not yet been the victim of the 1981 assassination attempt. Speaking of the third secret of Fatima, he did not allude to anything resembling a future assassination attempt, uh, but rather imminent chastisement and worldwide tribulation. Um, now, you could dispute that because you could say, well, he didn't say the assassination wouldn't take, I mean, again, we could, um, but it does seem like John Paul II is saying, yeah, the third secret's got a pretty big deal here. Um, and there are some going to be some major tribulations in the world, which does seem in lockstep with what, um, has been said. Um, but then another thing that's interesting to add to the mystery of it, this is the Bishop of Fatima. And this is 1984. Alberto Cosme de Amaral spoke of the third secret during a question and answer session at the Technical University of Vienna, Austria. And his comments were uh, published in February 1985 in an issue of Mensachem de Fatima. And he says, The secret of Fatima speaks neither of atomic bombs nor nuclear warheads, nor perishing missiles, nor SS-20s. I don't know what that is, some sort of weapon. Its content concerns only our faith. To identify the secret with catastrophic announcements or with a nuclear holocaust is to deform the meaning of the message. The loss of faith of a continent is worse than the annihilation of a nation. And it is true that the faith is continually diminishing in Europe. Which is true as well. So the multiple layers of the of the message. And again, um, this bishop here uh, speaking about... Um, the third secret. Well, this whole idea of the major loss of faith of a continent, that doesn't seem like that was revealed in the 19 uh, or in the 2000 thing, mainly just about that episode in Rome. So again, here with Fatima, we see this major mystery um, and we see why there is such a major conspiracy mindset behind this thing, because you find little nuggets where people, are, bishops, popes are saying, and bishops who should know, and popes who should know, saying, well, it contains this, but then that 2000 comes along and you go, that didn't allude to all the things you had said. So anyway, um, one of the reasons uh, why this message is so important and why the truth about the third secret is so important, ironically, is because of the things that these popes and bishops have said, because it titillates the mind and says, wait, are you saying major tribulation and people are going to get their heads cut off and blood and all those sorts of things? And then the next hand, you have Bishop of Fatima saying, it's mainly a spiritual message, essentially, that um, the loss of souls is the greatest. I don't know. So, um, again, when we look at the whole corpus of everything that's been revealed about the third secret, the message, and so forth, um, to go back to uh, Pope John the Twenty Third talking about prophets of doom, I definitely doesn't. It doesn't. It's not obvious that he's referring to the seers of Fatima. Um, however. Um, the prophecy of doom, I guess you could say, there's good reason why people think that that's something that's imminent. And we have popes and bishops that say that to us. So there is a little bit of mystery there. Absolutely. And uh, I will definitely concede a great deal uh, regarding the naivete at Vatican II and the talking or dialoguing with communists and whatnot, which we'll all agree on. But that is going to be saved for next week. So next week, we'll we'll get into the historical commentary again. Mm -hmm. So we'll be finally at the Second Vatican Council. And what we've tried to show... <laughs> yeah, what we've tried to show is that the issues regarding the Second Vatican Council were already at play for 150 years or so at that point. And so there's a lot of different factors. Vatican II is complex. It's a very complex council. It's, it's not just a totally black and white picture about what happened. So we'll try to get into that further. I hope this discussion debating has been helpful to you viewers and just an encouragement for all of us to develop the mental virtue of prudence and, and rational debate so that we can really approach this as men of God, debate it, hammer out the evidence and pursue truth and charity. So let's offer up a pater noster for that intention that uh, especially once again, please go and subscribe to the Ch Crusade channel so that we can build up the show for Ke the Kennedy profession to re release so that we have enough of subscribers. I'm not sure where they are. Do you know how many subscribers so far, Kennedy? I'm not sure yet. Um, okay. But yeah. 
Well, we'll update you. So please, there's there's different, also different levels. So please, if you can afford it, please choose a higher level so that we can get more subscribers and, and get this thing going for Kennedy and the Hall family. So let's offer up a pater noster. <clears throat> In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster qui es in cedis, sanctificetu nomen tuum, adveniet regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Anum nostrum quotidianum de nobis odie, dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, ene nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amalo. Amen. In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus is King.